da -da -da. All nurseries have made mistakes, and, and I would venture to say that every nursery in the U.S. right now is selling some stock that is incorrect. Hello, my name is Rhea Wincoller, and I am the producer and cider MC of this weekly podcast, where we speak with makers, cider enthusiasts, and folks within the cider trade from around the world. Bringing us into episode 423 of Cider Chat, we heard from John Bunker discussing the discrepancies that could be found at nurseries that grow apples. So let's say, for instance, you think you're buying a golden russet, an apple tree, but it isn't. And this is one of the mysteries that still hangs over apples in general because there's so many different varieties and they've been held together through oral tradition, people writing things down or not writing it down, keeping notes. Well, John is one of the guys, along with many other researchers out there, who are helping us find some of the hidden mysteries of apples. He even wrote a book on the topic. It's called Apples and the Art of Detection. And if you're not watching on YouTube right now, I'm holding this magnificent book up. He did all the artwork in it. It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. You want to get a copy of this? You can find links in the show notes at ciderchat.com or go to outonthelimapples.com. Now, this is part two of a three-part series I've been doing with John. The last episode was his keynote from New York Apple Camp in 2023. Absolutely magnificent. Uh, worth kind of sitting back and just taking that all in. Thank you for all the emails. I know John really got a lot of emails, as did I. We really appreciate it. On the next episode, it's going to be Apples 102, and that's on describing an apple phenotypically. If you don't understand what that means, don't worry, because John's going to guide you through that, and it's an absolute experiential experience. So if you have a bunch of apples on hand while you're listening to that episode coming up, they'll be coming up in two weeks, definitely get them now. But for this episode, enjoy. This is a master's class. And while you're there, I always recommend to grab a glass. I have a glass here, I have a glass here, and I have another glass right here. Different sizes, because what I'm trying to do is get my arm strength up, <laughs> because I'm going to France, coming up to lead the French cider tour to Paris, Normandy, and Brittany. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of arm strength. You know, you got to, like, really kind of get ready for raising all those glasses. And for this episode here, I'm holding up a bottle to the screen. I'm going to be trying this little cider here. This is from the UK. It's called Showering's Triple Vintage. And that will give you a little hint hint of some upcoming episodes on Cider Chat. But without further ado, I recommend that we all grab a glass and join this chat with John Bunker of Super Chili Farm, based up in Palermo. Maine. I live in central Maine on a small farm. We have about 600 apple trees of about 350 or 400, I guess you'd call them different cultivars. A lot of them are seedlings and selections that people have sent me. It's really more of an experimental orchard. We have a large, rare, we call it a rare apple CSA in the fall where no Max, no Cortlands, no Honeycrisp, you know, it's just all odd apples, and we have 175 shareholders, uh, and we do different varieties each week throughout the fall. And focus has been on every part of apples. We, we press cider, but we don't sell it. But I think my passion has been trying to track down historic apples, particularly ones in Maine. Why do we need apple identification? The mistakes have been rampant as long as there have been cultivars or you know, varieties, whichever you prefer. And the pomological writers of the past, the famous ones, Beach, Hedrick, Hogg, Downing, they had lots of challenges. Some of them were just working with writing that had been sent to them by other people or apples that might not have been in the best of conditions or cultivars that were grown in multiple different locations. We call it phenotyping. That phenotyping, that's what we're going to be talking about mostly today. And it's really, really hard to do. All nurseries 
have made mistakes, and, and I would venture to say that every nursery in the U.S. right now is selling some stock that is incorrect. And that's not a condemnation, and any nursery that thinks they aren't is delusional. So, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to help them, you know. And all, all commercial apple orchards have, well, most of them don't label any of their trees, but the ones that they think they know what they have and they often don't as well. Why should you learn to do Apple IDs? Well, one, one thing is you find something somewhere by the side of the road or, or in your neighbor's backyard or behind an old barn or in a commercial orchard or somewhere and you really like it, but you don't know what it is. And in many cases, they don't know what it is. Um, you also want to share something, like at the Scion Exchange tomorrow morning, or you sell a few trees from your little nursery that you have on your farm, or maybe your nursery owner or something. It would be kind of nice if you were correct with what you were selling. And also, another big reason is if you want to be preserving historic apples, like is a big part of what I do, and so we have a lot of incentive to attempt to sort out what it was that was being grown. In my case, it's in Maine because that's where my focus is. It's also really fun to know what you have. I've taught a bunch of people, particularly I, I for many years ran this nursery, Fedco, some of you have heard of it, and one of our best grafters, he's, he's a little younger than me and he's been grafting now about 30 or 40 years and I taught him to graft. And he said, well, I went home that afternoon. He was so excited. And he grafted like eight varieties onto one of the trees in his yard. And I said, well, did you label them? And he said, oh, no, I knew I would never forget the names of any of them because I was so excited. And then he said, half an hour later, he'd forgotten all of them. So that's also about labeling, but it's also about identifying. So I'm going to talk about three apple scenarios today. And the first is that you have an apple and you have a name. For example, golden russet, that's a good one. Or foxwell, that's another good one. So you have an apple, you have a name, but you want to verify what you have. How are you going to do that? The second is you have an apple, but no name. So then it's a case of lost identity. Or third, you have a name, but no apple. And that is maybe the most challenging, but that is like a case of missing persons. So I've had many human mentors, and you'll see pictures of at least one or two of them, but I needed a like a sort of a philosophical mentor. And I, and I talked to all my friends who were into mysteries and so forth and so on. And finally, I realized that it really had to be Sherlock Holmes. So I read um, the complete Sherlock Holmes multiple times, and I realized that, that Sherlock Holmes was doing what I've been trying to do and what you all will be trying to do if you um, get into this identifying apples. And he had three things that made a good, a good detective. One is to learn how to do deduction. So that's one. The second one is to learn to be an observer, and that's what I put up here. And the third is to amass, essentially, a database in your head. We are also really into written databases, but, but you're, you're going to waste a gigantic amount of time if you don't have a lot of this stuff in your head, and we'll talk about that. Sherlock Holmes' most famous statement is, how often have I said to you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. If you're into Sherlock Holmes or you want to get into them and it's, they're fabulous, you could just Google that, eliminate the impossible, and you'd get all sorts of stuff. So your job, my job when I'm doing IDs, is to eliminate the impossible. After all... If, you're, if you know anything about the history of apples in the United States or in North America, by around the time of the Civil War, there were somewhere around 15 to 20,000 named cultivars. So if 
when, when you come across an apple, if you went through every single one of them, that would be the only thing that you ever did for the next like two or three years. So your job, eliminate the impossible rapidly. There are some things that, that are sort of basics to apple identification. One is that you need to learn the parts of the apple. And so tomorrow, I'm going to do a class just in describing all the parts of an apple. And whether you decide you want to be an apple identifier or not, whether it's just like other stuff that you come across or more than that, as an orchardist, it would be really handy for you to know all the parts of the apple and how to describe them. You also, especially as an identifier, and that's really what we're focusing on, you need to know the difference between a seedling and a grafted tree. If you live where seedlings are common, and in the Northeast and uh, some parts of the Midwest, there are many seedling apple trees. I've heard numbers in the tens or hundreds of millions of seedling apple trees in North America now. If somebody hands you an apple from a seedling, it may be phenomenal, and many are, but it has no name, not until you give it one. So, so you're going to waste, or whatever, a lot of time trying to identify apples that have no names. The seedlings are like we all were before our parents named us. In many old orchards, the, the grafted tree has died. In some cases, it's totally gone, and you find a ring of, of small trees, or the trees can't even be big. I've seen root sprouts from old grafted trees that were like this big, and they're, they are root sprouts from the rootstock of the tree 100 years ago or 150 years ago. So they actually are older than the variety itself because the rootstock was planted, typically, and then when it got to be about 12 feet tall, they cut it off at breast height and then grafted it right there. So these rootstocks are very interesting genetically because they can tell you a lot about what was going on historically in your site long, long ago. So sometimes seedlings and grafted trees can look very similar at first. These are two seedling trees. The one on the left is, uh, to me, this is obviously a seedling because it has no remnants of any large old branches. In other words, there was never a structure to that tree. The one on the right, and pardon my artwork, but the one on the right sort of has a graft bulge, which some of these do, but also has remnants of, of old lower limbs that have long ago rotted and fallen off. And then the tree, left unchecked, has just grown to be tall and to become an umbrella. And people often say to me, it's Murphy's Law that the fruit is, you know, 25, 30 feet up. And I say, no, it's actually not Murphy's Law. It's no one pruned it. So these are some other typical grafted trees. The one on the left, you all know water sprouts, or most probably all of you do. Sometimes the water sprouts can be a foot in diameter. But you can often see the old structure of the tree when it was a cultivated tree many, many years ago, perhaps generations ago. So like the, like the one in the center. And the one on the right, often the trees were pruned into a vase shape. <clears throat> So at least around where I live, many trees were cleft grafted. We don't do it anymore, but I found many, uh, they never bothered to cut off both stems. So the stems now, again, are a foot, two feet, three, even three feet in diameter. You know, it's, it's a, actually when they're cleft grafted, it's really nice because usually the graft is very visible. So sometimes when there's a single trunk like these two, you can have on the, on the left, you can have when the rootstock was more vigorous than the scion. And now again, these trees are 120, 150 years old. Sometimes I've seen them where there's actually a shelf and you could sit as old as like a bench around the tree. 
And then often the scion is more or was more vigorous than the rootstock and you have the reverse. And I've seen that many times. The rootstock can also coexist with the tree. So many times people say to me, oh, I found two varieties on a tree. Well, actually they didn't. Sometimes they do, but often it's because the rootstock, and that's that, that blue arrow on the left, kind of snuck out and produced a branch or a trunk or a stem underneath the, the graft. And then you can see it a lot on people's lawns where, where you see an, or a pink ornamental crab and half of it or a quarter of it or whatever is white flowering. That's not a double grafted tree. That's the rootstock. So part of what you're going to do is learn the age of a tree when you look at it. I'm always asking people, do they know when their trees were planted? And so, and plus, I, my first grafted trees at my place are now about 35, 40 years old. And so I'm watching them. And now, now they have different vigor rates and, you know, whatever. There's a lot of variability, but still, you can learn a lot. These, these are three wealthy trees, three different trees from an orchard near me that was planted by my mentor's father in 1906. And so every time I would go there, I would like impl imprint them on my brain because although wealthy is not a vigorous tree, it's not a big tree, it still gives me an idea. And so I'm always asking people, the reason why it's important is that certain cultivars were planted at certain historical times. So with wealthy, you know wealthy came to Maine, you know, about 1880, 1890, and was planted pretty commonly until, oh, about, about 1930 or so. so. So having that understanding of like, you look at a tree, people bring me an old tree fruit, and I look at the tree, the tree's really old. It can't be Honeycrisp. It's not possible because, you know, of when Honeycrisp was introduced. Another thing you want to do is become familiar with the apples that were traditionally grown in your area. So you find something really weird that doesn't make any sense and is in your neck of the woods? Yes, but 95% of the time, the trees that you'll find, even the ones that, were, that no one has seen for generations, they are the ones that, that were historically grown in your county, in your province, state, town, whatever. So in our work, we maintain lists of town by town in Maine. So when somebody brings me a, a, a fruit from, you know, there's a town right near us called Washington, I can go to my database, click on all the apples, or look, I have folders too, and I could pull out a sheet. Now, is it gonna be one of those? Maybe not, but there's a very high degree of likelihood that there will. So you need to learn what was grown in your area. And that's also a really useful thing to know anyway, because if you're an orchardist, maybe people come to you and they say at your farm stand, gosh, I'd like to grow this stuff that was, you know, used to be grown in, you know, wherever you live. Well, many of them you can still find the sign with somewhere, and then you can grow historic apples, and they're a big seller. People love, now, you're still going to sell way more honey crisp or, you know, whatever it is, crispy crisp, but you're <laughs> going to still bring people in because they're going to see all those cool apples that you have. This is one of my favorite pieces of art and one of my favorite pieces of music. And you want to train your brain to know certain apples instantly. So, for example, you know, I grew up with, with the Beatles. And if they play like, like one half of a second of one of those songs, I know it instantly. Do I know it because I say, oh, that's John's voice or, you know. No, it's just, it's just somewhere in my brain. So what you want to do with certain varieties, certain cultivars, is you want to have that in your brain. Because in Maine, for example, we don't want to waste our time identifying Macintosh. And a lot of people will bring me Macintosh. But 
If I spend an hour figuring out that it's Macintosh, what about that rare, cool, historic thing that I'm not spending my time on? So once you get your sort of like dirty dozen or whatever, the ones that are co really common that keep coming over and over again wherever you live. In Colorado, there's Jonathan. In you know, Pennsylvania, it's probably wine sap. But you know, you learn those and then you like put them in your cup holder in your car or you set them on, the, on your counter in front of where you do the dishes and you stare at them. You play them over and over and over again so that when you see them, oh, well, the cavity is acute and the stem is medium thick. You just like, ding, you know, and then you can go on to the really fun hard stuff. So in Maine and much of New England, the three that you probably need to know the most are these three. Macintosh, Cortland, and Honeycrisp. I do have little things that I know about them to remind me just in case I don't know instantly when I see them. But again, they're not obvious unless you take the time to really learn them. And Cortland, which is a, a child of Macintosh, a lot of people confuse the two, but once you learn them, oh my goodness, they're totally different. Also, Macintosh, if you don't know it, has I think the most distinctive flavor of any North American apple. You could take a hundred apples and blindfold somebody that knows Macintosh, give them a teeny taste of each, and you get to Macintosh and it's just like, ding, you know. So there are many excellent resources for apple identification. I'm going to go through a few. The best is this book, which is seven volumes. That's Dan Bussey, and, and this is my little organ <coughs> shot here. Some of you knew Nick Botner. Some of you know Sean Shepard. Sean lives here in Portland. And Dan and me went out and spent several days with Nick 11 years ago. And it was just so fun. Nick, if you don't know him, lived in Yonkala, Southern Oregon, and had about, uh, I don't know, five to 10,000 apple uh, cultivars. And this is Dan just about a month ago when we were in Boulder. Um, and that's, that's his book set. It's, it's very inexpensive for what it is, and it is the number one apple history book ever written in the English language. The title of the book is The Illustrated History of Apples in the U.S. and Canada by Dan Bussey. And there's a full episode with Dan at ciderchat.com. So if you're into this, and they're only doing one printing. They still have copies. I highly, highly recommend it. But my favorite book is the two-volume set of Beach, although I love Dan. We're close friends, and I have a set and use it every day. But if you get a set of Beach, they're just totally awesome. Also, uh, the USDA watercolors, many of them, they're historic. They were roughly around 1900. Um, they're spectacular. They're all online. And, and the one thing about Dan's book that is you know slight shortcoming, if you want to say, is that with the watercolors, many cultivars, they have five or 10 watercolors of a cultivar. He only was able to put in one. But it's still, Dan's book is, is fantastic. There's also old timers that you should know. And you have to find them. And this was mine. This is Francis Fenton. And that was my apprentice of the time. His name was Laura Seeger. And she was 22, and he was 99 when that photo was taken. And his, his father was the one that planted those wealthies in 1906. And Francis, I got to know him when he was quite a bit younger, but still when he was pretty old. And he, he was generous, fun, loved to talk, and loved his orchard. He had about uh, maybe 100 varieties, many of them. He had just collected roaming around the county where he lives in central Maine. Um, but there are people out there who want to connect with you, who are older and who know a lot, and you want to take advantage of them. There's many other resources. 
random strangers, many of whom I've met, and next thing I knew I was in their car driving into the Willy Wonk somewhere to look at an old tree. Old newspapers, there's many other classic books, uh, many of them are online. Old nursery catalogs, pomological yearbooks, letters, journals, maps. This list here was something that was probably about 100 years old, and a person just showed up when I was giving a, doing a display at a fair and just brought me this list. These are so priceless because you know where this was and what they were growing and when they were growing it, which is just so handy. MyFruitTree.org plays a big role in my Apple identification now and will in yours as well. Uh, the program is run by a man named Cameron Peace at Washington State University in Pullman, and they do DNA profiling. The brief version of how it works is that there is a database, we call it the reference panel, to which the DNA that you send in, the reason why I have a leaf there is because you send in a leaf or a few leaves, and it is compared to a database, and then if there's a match, then presumably it's correct, but we're going to get into that too. There's two tests. One is the simple test, which is just about the cultivar. Oh, it's a Macintosh or a Northern Spy or whatever. And then there's a full test, which can tell you the ancestry of the apple. So, and we'll talk more about what it can and can't do. This is an apple from a tree that's, that's gone now, but it's one that we have not been able to identify yet. And many times when you submit leaves for a DNA analysis, they come back as unique unknown. And what that means, it means a number of different things. It could be a seedling, like we talked about earlier. Because the seedlings are unnamed, it's not gonna have a name, so it's, there's gonna be no match. Um, unless that one has been sent in before, but you know, it wouldn't have been. It could be a common cultivar that is not yet in the database. Although the database is large, it is by no means complete. Um, and it could be some rare cultivar that you're looking for. So in our work, we love those unique unknowns because those are, because we've gotten pretty good at determining whether something's a seedling or not, and the age of the tree and so forth, we are looking for those unique unknowns because those are the rare historic apples, in our case of Maine or, or other parts of New England, that we're looking for. So that is a step towards identification. So the, the key that I like the best, this is now on paper, is called Systematic Pomology by U.P. Hedrick. It's not an old book, and well, now 100 years old, but that's not very old in, in the book world. And it's really good, but it's limited. There's, there's 80 cultivars, and there are 80 really well-selected cultivars, and it's one of these things where, you know, you do this, and if you do this, you go this way. If you go do that, you go that way. It's a true key. It's good, but limited, especially if you get into rare stuff or, of course, anything that was released after 1923 you know, or 4. The American Fruit Culturist, John Thomas, with another famous earlier book, it has a key, which is pretty good, and, and I do use it, but... I mostly use this key that I'm developing. And the Fruit Manual by Robert Hogg he is like one of the greatest of all English pomological writers. And his is really difficult to use, but, but his writing is phenomenal. And if you're into um, English apples, either the ones that were imported into the US or North America, or if you're just into what was going on in the UK, um, Hogg is like, the number one. So right now, and I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this very, very long because we have a lot to, to do here. We're currently working on a, a searchable database. What we're working on now is, is a, I have a searchable database that I've been using for myself that's really not in a form that anybody else can use. And right now, amongst a bunch of us around the country, we're working on 
what will be a reference panel database, which will have all the DNA information in it from everywhere in the country. And it will also be a searchable key because it will be a database you could start searching anywhere. You could start with the color of the skin or the size of the calyx or the length of the stem or whatever. So that's really exciting. We've applied for a big grant through the USDA. Cameron, that I mentioned earlier, is, is very involved. Gail Volk from Fort Collins, if you know who she is, she's very involved in it too. And a bunch of other people from around the country. So we hope that there'll be a prototype up by this summer. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. So let's do some IDing. We have three scenarios, like I said. You have the apple and the name. You have the apple but no name, or you have the name but no apple. And I'm going to do several examples of each from my own experience, which hopefully will help you as you try to figure out what you're going to do. The short version of the golden russet is that if you're growing golden russet, you might not be. So, so, so we'll leave it at that. Process of, you know, scenario one is to obtain half a dozen to a dozen apples from the tree. The reason why you do that is that you're going to cut them up in different ways, but also because if you were very clever about it, you could pick an apple from a very common cultivar and fool anyone. Because not only is every cultivar unique, every apple on every tree is unique. Now, they're pretty similar, and they're not unique genetically. They're identical genetically, but phenotypically, everyone, this one, if you measured it with a micrometer, this one is like two millimeters bigger, or this one's a little more oblate, this is a little more oblong, whatever. And so what I do, if I'm getting serious about it, if I'm just like somebody shows me an apple and, you know, I might know it, I might not, but if we're like really getting into it, I want to see, if possible, 12 or even 20 apples because then I can look at what's the commonality. Even though some of these are a little rounder and some are a little more oblate, this is a conic apple or, or whatever. Or these basins are, are, always, are really abrupt even though some are obtuse. I, you got to come tomorrow. We'll talk about these terminologies tomorrow. So you have this apple. This is the famous Mactose apple that, that, was, that we found in a, in a farm stand in New York City. I've never heard of the Mactose apple, and I don't think anybody else has either. But, but, but this, this is one of my favorite slides. And I'm not really sure what the Mactose apple was. I didn't actually take any home and try to identify it. But anyway, you, you get the apples, you know, half a dozen, a dozen, whatever. And then you compare. You're going to learn the terminology during tomorrow's class. You compare the description in Bussy or in Hog or whatever. And you say, OK, so the cavity looks good, the basin looks good, the calyx is open, the core is abaxile, whatever. And then you say, OK, I think it's probably correct. It's correct enough for me. I'm not selling them in my nursery, so this is, this is good enough. But then you can submit leaves to myfruittree.org, and they can DNA profile them. If they do, and it comes back, yes, this is whatever, Northern Spy or Rome or something, then, then you've got to double check. And then you can compare those results back to, and maybe, and maybe it says, no, this is not, we have a, there's an orchard I know of that said they had Baldwins, and they were just not, they were so not Baldwins. And I thought they were probably Rome, and we sent them off, and they came back, they were Rome. So what you want to do if the results don't, don't fit with what you thought it was going to be, then you take the results and compare them to Bussy or, or and a lot of this, some of this is online. So this is the man who introduced me to Black Oxford. He was another of my mentors. His name was Ira Proctor. And he had an orchard only of about eight or 10 trees, but they were really, really, really old. And he brought this apple into a store where I was the store manager when I was in my 20s. 
and he said, would you like to sell these on consignment? Because we did a lot of consignment sales. And I said, sure. And then I bought both bushels, all of them, and took them all home because I'd never seen it before. And other old timers told me about it. And, you know, one thing led to another. I was pretty sure it was correct. I never really knew, but I was pretty sure it was correct. And we'll say I've seen maybe 20 or 30 really ancient black Oxford trees in Maine. Then eventually we did do a DNA profile of it. And we did several black Oxfords. They all came back that they were identical to each other. I think our black Oxford is probably the one in the reference panel, though I, I'm not sure. But the other thing we learned, because we did a full test, is that black Oxford's parents are Blue Pear Maine and Hunt Russet. Now, it, that totally makes sense and helps with the ID because Hunt Russet and Blue Pear Maine both are Massachusetts apples and Maine was part of Massachusetts back then. Many of the Europeans that settled in Maine came from Massachusetts, and Blue Pear Maine and Hunt Russet are two of like the most classic, long-keeping, super high-quality early North American heirlooms. But when somebody tells you something, like Ira Proctor told me about Black Oxford, you don't necessarily want to believe everyone. So this fellow is named Henry Nutting, and he was told that his tree was a nutting bumpus, which is an apple that originated in Arista County, which is Maine's most northern county. And then I got an apple called New Brunswicker from another Mainer, an old guy, and and as we got into all of this and we're growing them ourselves and so forth, we started to think, you know, these are, they're probably all duchess. Well, duchess, if you know your hardy apples, is uh, probably the most famous of all hardy apples. It originated, nobody knows where, but somewhere in probably east, uh, western Russia. And it was like the apple that made apple growing possible in northern New England and a lot of the upper Midwest and a, and a lot of Canada. So eventually we did have them all tested and they all came back to be identical, which is very hard for some Canadians because New Brunswick, of course, originated in New Brunswick and they claimed it was sort of a better duchess. And we're still wondering, well, you know, have we just not found the true uh, New Brunswick, and maybe we haven't, but I also think probably <laughs> it was always just Duchess. So, you know, I talked about strangers. I was at a fair, and this guy came up to me at the fair and said, I have an apple that you're going to love. And I was like, yeah, okay. And then, you know, then the next, you know, and, and he said, you got to come to my farm. And so I didn't go. And a year later, he came back to the same fair, brought his daughter, and said, you have to come to my farm. So I went and uh, immediately fell in love with his apple. He had four trees, very, very old, obviously grafted, all identical. He had bought the farm from two bachelor brothers, and the farm had been in the family since just post-revolution, and everybody in the neighborhood always called it Canadian strawberry. And I couldn't find it in any book anywhere, but I did find one called Washington Strawberry, which is a New York apple and exists in the Tower Hill Botanic Garden uh, collection. If you know Tower Hill, it's in Massachusetts, a really excellent collection that's had a lot of uh, disease problems, but I won't go into that. So I thought, okay, it probably is Washington Strawberry, and eventually we had them both DNA profiled. They are identical. Which brings up the whole issue of like, so was Roy, this was Roy Slam, who became a really good friend of mine, was he wrong? And, and no, he wasn't wrong. And for those of you that live in the mid-Atlantic states, is it really Newtown Pippin or is it really Albemarle Pippin? And so there are synonyms and, and how the synonyms sort of evolve is all different ways. And does that mean somebody's right and somebody's wrong? No, it means they're synonyms. Now here we are at the Tower Hill Botanic Garden collection, and I spent hundreds of hours in it. This is Hunt Russet that you just saw a few slides ago around Black Oxford, one of, one of Massachusetts' first cultivars, probably you know 1,700 or so. 
and and I phenotyped it. So you know, I read everything I could. It's it is definitely a fully russeted, but it's one of the few russets that has a blush. So the blush can be orange, it can be red. The golden russets, the ones that you know, the the sort of quote unquote golden russets, they generally and and from my experience do not ever have a blush. And so I thought this was probably correct. Eventually, we had it DNA profiled, and we were, we were right. It was correct. But another issue with the reference panel is that the reference panel itself, to which the DNA is being, is being compared, is only as good as the phenotypers of his, the past, right? So there are mistakes in the DNA reference panel. And this you know, appears to be one of them. So Chandler is a northern spy look-alike, and if you read, and especially, you know, in Beach or Bussy, they'll talk about how similar Chandler is to a northern spy. And so we had, we had our Chandler DNA profile, and it came back as northern spy, which was really interesting to me, and particularly because Here's the basin. So the basin is the, is the top of the apple. So when you put an apple on a table in North America, it's upside down. The, the bottom is the stem. So if you look at the basin, which is the calyx end, which is this, and you look at those two, the Chandler is what we call regular, which means that it's round and smooth to the touch, and the Northern Spy is anything but regular. We would call it furrowed. So the fellow that did a lot of the early reference panel work is a man named Nick Howard, who now lives in the Netherlands. And, and I think that whoever sent him the original leaves of Chandler actually sent him Northern Spy. So that's one of the many mysteries, and we're gathering up lots of them that we're going to have to sort out. So part of our work with phenotyping is to correct and confirm and append the reference panel so that when you send in your Chandler, it comes back as Chandler, for example. So scenario two is you have an apple, but no name. It's a case of lost identity. So the process, same thing. You want to get six to 12 apples. And then the next thing is, do you have a seedling or a grafted tree? And back before digital photography, I would get fooled. I'd think maybe it was a grafted tree. I'd drive an hour and a half, and then I'd get there, and it's like, oh, God, it's another seedling. And now seedlings are really cool, but they're unidentifiable because they're seedlings. Now with digital, the, the first thing that I do when I talk to people, because I do hundreds of IDs, the first thing I say to them is, I don't even care about seeing the fruit. Just send me four or five photographs via an email of the tree. That's what I want to see first. And often, they'll send me something, and I'll look at the tree, and I'll go, ay, 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 I want to go visit that tree, because it's like ancient, this big, hollow, really cool. And then a lot of times I can say, OK, that's a seedling. Now, I still might be have really a lot of fun seeing the fruit, because a lot of my favorite uh, selections now are from seed, but in terms of IDs, it's, it's key. You gotta know if it's a seedling. So then I talked to you about having lists of what was grown in that area, you know, and if you're mostly doing IDs around where you live, then it's just a matter of old, you know, old newspapers, old nursery catalogs, old whatever, lists and journals and, you know, and then you'll have an idea of what it could be. So then you, you know, eliminate the impossible. This is red, so I can get rid of Rhode Island greening, you know, and so forth and so on, till you get to a point where you think you might know what it is. And if you're pretty sure, then you may not want to spring 50 bucks or whatever it is to have a DNA profile. But if it's a really cool tree and they're interested in helping you, maybe you do. So then you submit the leaves, and then again, you compare the results. This is a seedling that's about an hour and a half from me. 
and, and my friend Roberto, who was one of my fruit exploring buddies, he brought me the fruit. And if you know your Ben Davis, it has that Ben Davis look, although this is sort of like a black Ben Davis look or whatever. It has that cavity with the, with the uh, russet splash and so forth. And I said to him, that's a Ben Davis. And he was like, no, that's not a Ben Davis. You got to taste it. So I tasted it as an excellent dessert fruit. Then he took me to the tree. The tree's growing by the side of a cemetery. Um, it's got those two stems. Um, it's in a place. So one of the things about seedlings is where is it growing? Is it like on the high tide line? Or is it like, you know, by this cemetery where no one ever, you know, maybe somebody would have planted a tree. But, but remember, you're trying to eliminate the impossible. So, or at least get, you know, limit. So I was able to look at it and say, you know, this is a seedling. But it's got excellent fruit, and now we have it growing in our orchard. And we call it Roberto after, after our buddy who just passed away a year ago. So the second scenario, you've got apples in your own, you know, that may be in an orchard that you purchase. So our next door neighbor had an old orchard. We eventually purchased it. And, and because he was getting old and, you know, I didn't want it to turn into house lots or something. So it had this tree, which as you can see is completely hollow and it has that like flying buttress that's sort of holding it up. I've learned obviously, a com one of the common ones around town, one of them is famous, which is also called snow. I was pretty sure I was correct, so I made an educated guess, and I called it famous. But eventually, I thought, okay, well, I'll submit it, and I was correct. So commercial orchards, I mentioned, they're often wrong. One of my best friends owns a commercial orchard, and he was told by the old-timer whom he bought the orchard that it was pound sweet. Pound sweet is a mainism for an apple in, in southern Mass, in southern New England, called, called pumpkin sweet. The season was wrong. It didn't look right. I couldn't figure out what the heck it was. And eventually, we had a DNA profile. It came back as another sweet apple. So a sweet apple, historically, is an apple that has little or no acidity, a la the bittersweets. If you see a historic East Coast apple, that has the word sweet in the name, you know it's low acid, just like an apple in the UK that has the word bittersweet, you know it was low in acidity. This apple tree, and, and there's like, you know, 15 people all doing a group pruning there. This is a cleft grafted tree, it's kind of hard to see it. You know, I couldn't figure out what it was. I really wanted it to be this old main apple called Blake, but you know, you can wish but, but if you wish something hard enough, it still doesn't necessarily come true. And, and as I say here, I had my doubts. And, but I had a neighbor who had moved away. She was very old. And I wrote to her once and asked her for her recollections of what she remembered on, as they would always call it, the farm when she lived in town. And she said that Grimes Golden was in her. And Grimes Golden... Is a is a unusual enough name that just a sort of a random sort of normal person in our area wouldn't have heard of it unless they probably really did have it. She said that they had Grimes. I got to know it at Tower Hill. That's Grimes at Tower Hill in the center. And then I was incredibly fortunate to become a friend of Tom Burford. Some of you have heard of him. Mr. Apple, dot Professor Apple from Virginia. And so I figured if anybody would know Grimes, it would be Tom. So eventually I sent fruit to him, and he said, yes, it's Grimes. And then we had a DNA profile, and it was also came back as correct. This is an apple also near me by the side of the road. I learned about it because the the local highway was going to put in a new on-ramp, and they were going to cut it down. And the local neighbors all panicked and, and wrote to me, and I got in touch with the town. And eventually, this was in Waterville, which is sort of a slightly large town near us. And eventually, they said that they weren't going to cut it down. So we've been taking care of it and pruning it. And there's a really wonderful main book that was, and there may be something in your state, it's a, a master's thesis written in 1911 called The Apple Varieties of, in Maine by a guy named Bradford. 
And, and so I use that a lot to find out what was grown in what towns in the state, because that was a snapshot of 1911. And, and he talked about this old lost apple back then called the Kennebec Russet. And then I've spent a lot of time looking in old pomological yearbooks, which they exist in your state too. They are fantastic. And, and there was this apple called the Kennebec Russet. And it, the description fit, although the description is you know, very minimal. And so we think maybe we found it. So it may eventually get put in the reference panel. This is another really old apple. This one is dead now. And this is in the town of Belgrade, also one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time. And the, that's the color of the apples. They are that really beautiful lavender purple color that I've never seen in any other apple except in these apples from Russia called Arabco or Arabsco or, you know, there's a bunch of different names because when they imported all those apples in 1870, they tried to translate them from the Russian. They did a huge botch job. So I thought maybe that was correct, but we had it DNA profiled. It came back unique, but it also told us the parents, which are Blue Pear Maine again, and another very old American cultivar, Black Gilliflower. So it couldn't be the Russian, because that huge batch of Russian apples were imported in 1870. These apples way predate that, and they would never be the parents of a Russian apple. So we don't know yet what it is, but now we'll use that information of what the parents were, what the ancestors are, as we move forward and try to figure out what it what it is. So the full test, which is much more expensive, can be really useful, especially if you find something that you really like and really want to learn more about. So this is an apple that, that I've just started to, to try to learn about. It was found by friends on an island right off the coast of Maine in an exceedingly old orchard. There's two trees. They're identical, at least typically. So we're you know convinced that they're that they are grafted trees. And we did have a DNA profile, came back unique, unknown. So this is going to be a really fun project because we have really good lists of what existed around that area historically. And now we'll use this information to try to identify this. Um, so the tree age must make sense. So these are two trees on the left, the two ones in the foreground, that are identical. And, and I eventually thought that they might be an old apple that originated near Lewiston, Maine, near the town of Auburn, called Briggs Auburn. It, they actually originated in the town of Minot, but it's all right around that area. And the cultivar Briggs Auburn is so old that I was saying to myself, you know, you're probably wrong, because these trees, although this orchard here um, is easily 100 years old, the Briggs Auburn trees, if I ever find them, are going to have to be like 200 years old. Then I eventually found the oldest farm in Minot. Some people came to me, and they had the same apple. And so this is, this is like within miles of where it originated. And, but you could see that tree is not really old either. That's at the most 100, 120. I spent a lot of time with the watercolor. There's a watercolor Briggs Auburn. Um, and I stared at it for hours and hours and hours. And then we found this tree, which is near Augusta, Maine, right in the center of town, the center of the state. And somebody said to me, you know what? That's a Northwestern greening. And, and I had totally discounted that cultivar. Then I started reading more about it and realized it was pretty common in central Maine, beginning around 1900. So we had it DNA profiled, and yes, it came back as Northwestern greening. So we're still working on Briggs Auburn. So you can you know, sort of be careful what you wish for. OK, so scenario three. You have a name, but no apple. It's a case of missing persons. In some ways, way more fun than the others, but, or as fun as the others, but it's really challenging because at this point, you essentially have nothing but a name. And, and, you know, the first question before I didn't even write this down is like, well, does it even still exist? And one of the things that people say to me is, 
you know, so how many of the historic apples are gone and, you know, and so forth and so on. Um, my guess is that way more of them are still out there than you'd think, whether it's here or in the UK or in France or in Spain. It's just a matter of, of really looking, getting to know the old timers. And so here's my process. You write an article in the newspaper, you know, uh, in September, you know, looking for old apples or just about old apples. And people will call. We've had people call the newspaper. You go driving around. You know, unfortunately, many of the oldest trees I've found are not visible from the road. So the road trip it can be fun, but you've got to do other things too. You know, you've got to meet the old timers. And I'm going to talk about wanted posters uh, in a minute. And then you're the magnet. You have a little fair at your town, and you put a little apple display out on a card table of 15 apples. And you know what? People are just going to come. They want to see what you have. They, then what do they want to do? They want to tell you about theirs. You know, and you do tastings. So we do tastings. We do displays. I do talks. Most of the talks I do is like, you know, the Waterville Historical Society, and there's four people there. But you know what? Those people are there because they really want to be there, and those are often really cool people that have really interesting information. So you don't need to go to, like, CiderCon, you know. You need to go to the next town, to the garden club or, you know, whatever. And you want to keep your eyes open because, because something's going to come along and you're going to be, like, thinking about, you know, something that, you know, is not worth thinking about, and you're going to miss it. So, so this is an example. This was the Briggs Auburn. That's the watercolor Briggs Auburns. And, and I wrote an article, or somebody wrote an article in the Lewiston Auburn paper, and then all these people started calling. And so one of the places we went was this apple. That's about 20, 25 years ago. And, and it was a really cool old tree, but yellow bellflower which actually is a really awesome apple. So road time. So when I got into looking for Blake, and that's a big story, and I won't really go into that, except that I met Norman Blake. That's the guy with the mustache on the left. And he got in touch with me. He says, I'm going to take you to where all the Blakes lived. And so we went way out into western Maine, like hours from where I live, and he took me to all these old, including one with even has a sign, the old Blake farm. And then on the, the young woman, here's one of our apprentices. Somebody, somebody, you know, a friend went on a road trip, found some people who found some people who found these people. And so we went to their farm. This is a great tree. It's not Blake, but I do now have it grafted. It's, a, it's an old tree, sort of near where Blake would have been grown. You may have to, especially with the unique unknowns, the ones that aren't in the reference panel, you may have to convince somebody who you wish you didn't have to convince because then you could just pretend that you were correct. And this was Frank Getchell, and in my book I write a lot about him. He was the one who knew the Starkey apple. And the Starkey apple is one of the first apples that I really spent a lot of time trying to track down. And when I finally found the tree, through a, just a complete fluke, I realized that I was going to have to convince Frank. And when I finally brought in the apples, and he took a bite, and he said, this is it. And I thought, yes! <laughs> and he was a really nice guy. He was a lifelong orchardist. So be a magnet, as I said. So over on the right, we have the display of apples that we do at Common Ground Fair in Maine. If you ever want to come to Maine in the fall, it's towards the end of September. It's at Mofka, M-O-F-G-A. You could come visit me. I live half an hour away. And we have a display there of, you know, usually, you know, a couple hundred cultivars. And it's a magnet. People come in, and then next thing you know, oh, I want to, you know, here's this, you know, I want to tell you about my tree, you know, whatever. The two apples there on the left, Moses Wood and Somerset of Maine, I found them both just because of the display at the fair. An, uh, an old guy came in, and he said, I have these varieties that um, I'm growing in my farm, 
and I've never seen them anywhere else. They're both classic Maine uh, originated apples. I went and visited them, we became friends, and eventually I got the sign wood. And, and those, some would say the Maine might exist um, were it not for his tree, but Moses Wood is the only one that we've ever found. It would be gone. As I said at the beginning, you see, but you don't observe. I was at an Apple event at an Audubon place in Maine, and there was another display next to me of a local orchard. And they were on paper plates, but no one was there. They had just come in and nicely put up this little display, and I had my display. And then for a while, nobody was, no one was coming up to see me. So I thought, oh, let's see what, what they brought in. And there was this apple, Rolf. And it had been a, a classic Maine, another classic Maine apple that I had heard about and was looking for, but had never seen. And there it was, like three feet away from me on a paper plate. So the fair was over. I put my stuff in the car, went to that orchard, and there they were. And they had this old tree that is the picture there. That tree is now gone. That was planted in about 1900 by the owner's father. And now what I've done is I've grafted a bunch of trees for them so they still have it in their orchard because the local people have heard of Ralph. It's a, it's a Macintosh-ish type apple, sort of all-purpose, early to mid-fall apple that's quite excellent. The history of your town. And it's like, you know, a little pamphlet that's like this big. This is up in Aristic County in northern Maine. And I was looking for this apple, Dudley Winter, which is a little better known historic apple from Maine. And we couldn't find it, and we couldn't find it. And I was spending the night with friends up there. And my friend said, you know, and it used to be also called North Star. Um, and he said, well, you know, I remember something about some people that had uh, apples in this like pamphlet I have. So he rummages through all his old junk and finds this little pamphlet and we open it up and there is the story of these people that grew North Star. And it was this woman, Sophie Olson, and her husband, Walfred Jacobson. It's all Norwegians up there in Swedes in northern Maine. So the next day, he knew exactly where their farm was. We went there, the farm, all the buildings are long gone, but there were three rows of apple trees. It was really convenient. The center one was yellow transparent, which is another very common apple up there. And then there was a row of duchess and a row of something that looks like duchess, but if you know your duchess, it's definitely different. And that was Dudley Winter. So we had found that. We've also DNA profiled that now too. So I do these wanted posters. Not wanted dead or alive, but wanted alive. And we put them up in the town where we think the apple might have been grown. This is an apple called Sarah. And we do gorilla put-ups, or we ask the people in the gas station or whatever, and they let us put up our wanted posters. When I give a talk in Wilton, this is in Wilton, that was what I do. I deputize everyone at the talk and then hand them all posters to put out around Wilton. Then Wilton was a, like a really big, important apple-growing area in Maine, no longer, but was. The other issue with the wanted poster is that most people, they walk into the store and they don't even look, you know, because it's just like, you know, whatever, cigarette ads or, or political things that you wouldn't want to look at. So we put up a wanted poster at, at a fair for this apple, which is called Fairbanks. And they came to the booth, the people that live on the historic Fairbanks farm. And then they called me and the guy, this fellow here, said to me, well, I didn't see the wanted poster, but my daughter was kind of looking at all the stuff and the display and everything. She said, hey, Dad, we live on that farm. So we wound up going there, and we found this tree, which is, which is definitely a Fairbanks apple because it's very old, it's probably grafted, and it's on the Fairbanks farm. Whether it's the Fairbanks apple, we may never know because it's so rare. Another apple that I spent a lot of time trying to track down is the Marlboro apple, um, which is near Bar Harbor or Acadia National Park, for those of you that know Maine and New England. And um, uh, some people called me. They said, I know where the Seneca Remick, he was the one that originated the variety, where his farm was. They took me there. I found this tree. It has three varieties grafted onto it, Alexander, Tolman Sweet, 
classic Maine apples, well, not originated in Maine, but historic, and then this apple. And I thought, oh my god, I found it right in Seneca Remick's front yard. So Seneca Remick had been dead 100 years. Then we finally had a DNA profile, then oops, it's king of Tompkins County, which I know well, but I, I just wasn't thinking. Now we found another tree in the backyard, equally as old. We haven't had it DNA profiled yet, but we think maybe this is the true Marlboro apple. So what we'll be hoping is that when we have a DNA profile, it'll come back unique unknown. Okay, there you have it. You might have the apple and the name. You might have an apple but no name, and you might have the name but no apple. For more information, now my little advertisement, you can buy my book. Apples and the Art of Detection. Get them through our website or talk to me. It's out in the limapples.com and the work goes on. So as John Lennon said, I think it was the night he died, we are the torchbearers. We're the ones who have to take from the past and give to the future. And with apples, there's just such a perfect metaphor, which is the, we take the sign from the past, and that's my sort of pilgrimy guy there, and we pass the sign to the present, and then you get out your knife, you graft it, and then you pass it to the future. You too can do Apple IDs, and, and I hope that you'll give talks. And when you do, give them for free. And you'll meet really interesting people. And you know, you'll meet people of every sex, every gender, every identity, every political party, every religion, every non-religion. The apple is the perfect object plant in the world because it's so lovable and so wonderful and so useful and so educational. It teaches you everything about life. And I've been in talks with people that are just completely different from each other and completely different from me. And afterwards, what do they do? They all come line up because they want to tell me about their old tree and they want my help. So you'll be amazed at what you might find and one of my favorite people in the world, of course, is Isaac Newton. And even though they say it didn't really bounce in his head, I don't believe it. I really think it did. You'll sleep better, and the world will be a better place. So thank you very much. And with that, I leave you here. This is Rio Windcaller signing off for now. Looking forward to seeing you in Ciderville. Like there is a reason why we do it like this. Yeehaw!